gospel reading for this Sunday comes from Mark chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked. What's this wisdom that has been given him, that he even does miracles? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this... Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, only in his hometown, among his relatives and in his own house is a prophet without honor. He could not do any miracles there, except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. People like to say, never trust a skinny cook. And to that I would say, well, what about Chef Bobby Flay? What about Giada De Laurentiis? What about, what about Gordon Ramsay? What about these great, thin, fit TV chefs who can cook great meals and still somehow not have gained any weight from all the food that they're tasting? What about those people? And they would say, well, sure, but what about, what about Chef Duff from Ace of Cakes? And what about, what about Guy Fieri, that guy who goes around the country and eats every single meal that's put in front of him? What about these people? And I would say, okay, you've got a point. But not every chef needs to be a few pounds more than they need to be. What people are trying to say is, if you wouldn't trust a chef who eats their own food, you can't trust them. If a chef is not constantly going through the kitchen, tasting here and there to make sure that the soup is cooked well, to make sure that the meat is tender enough, if they don't even eat what they're putting out on the plate, then you can't trust them. They're a hack. They're no good. You wouldn't trust a mechanic that won't work on his own car. You won't trust a carpenter that doesn't fix his own house. You wouldn't trust a farmer that won't eat the corn that he got from his own field. It makes sense. If somebody is good at something, they should be able to enjoy the benefit of what they're doing. But people have this sort of attitude in other ways as well. If someone is really close to an industry expert, if it's a family member or a close childhood friend, they might not trust what that person has to say. Even if the person goes on to become famous, they'll say, I, I know you, I knew you when you were a little kid, you were nothing special back then and you're not special now. So don't tell me how to eat my food and don't tell me how to live my life because you don't know any better than me. I saw you when you were running around in diapers. That sort of attitude is common and even understandable. But now when it comes to Jesus, you would think that when Jesus came to his hometown that people would react differently. That they would say, here is the great teacher who has a message unlike any we've heard before, who is doing things that we've never seen with the amount of power that he has, but they treated him like he was just like anybody else. But they clearly had heard about him. They clearly had heard what he had been doing. They talk about the, the mighty acts that he had been doing by his hand. And if you look at the book of Mark leading up to chapter 6, Jesus is doing some remarkable things. He's been teaching his disciples and teaching the people in a way that nobody else ever had before. He told them the parable of the sower about a man who was spreading seed. He's talking about God's word and how it's shared with people. He's telling people what the kingdom of God is and how they can become a part of it. And the people are surrounding him. They're flocking to him because this was a message they hadn't heard before. Not from the other religious leaders of the day, not from their friends or their family, so everybody wanted to hear what Jesus had to say. And Jesus was performing miracles as well. If you go on in the book of Mark, you'll see that he was on a boat with his disciples. And a storm came up around them, and Jesus, with just his words, was able to calm the storm. And his disciples were amazed. They said, who is this that has this kind of power? And then Jesus got off the boat, and he found a man who had been possessed by a demon. And this man had an incredible amount of strength. The people around him recognized that this demon-possessed man was 
a danger to himself and to others, so they chained him to a wall, but the man broke out of the chains. And Jesus was able to cast that demon out of the man. So Jesus has power over nature, he has power over demons, and then Jesus met two other people. He found a little girl who was sick, and he found an old woman who was sick from bleeding. And Jesus was able to heal the old woman, and by the time he came to heal the girl, she had already died. But Jesus brought her back to life, because Jesus has power over health and sickness, over life and death. And then after doing all of those things, Jesus decided to come back home. And the people saw him, and he was teaching during the Sabbath day in the synagogue. And the people said, wait a minute. Now we've heard the stories about this guy. And they were amazed. And you would think that they would be amazed for the right reason, for the same reason that everyone else was amazed. This teaching that he has, where did he get this? This power that he has to do miracles, where did he get this power? But instead they're amazed that he should have the audacity to act like he was better than them. Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? So who are you, Jesus, to tell us anything? To act like you know better than us? To speak as though you have some kind of authority? We know you don't have any formal training. So in his own hometown, Jesus was a prophet without honor. Now many of you are trying to share that same message of Jesus with your friends and your family, with those in your lives. And the statistics say that 9 out of 10 people who go to church go because somebody they know invited them to go. And the statistics also say that between half and two-thirds of people who are invited to church We'll go. So supposedly, if you invited your neighbor to come, if you invited your friend to come to church, they would come. But many of you don't fit in that 50 to 75 percent, because many of you have family members and friends that you would very much like to come and see Jesus, but they don't want anything to do with him. Why is that? Well, what might they say about you? Why would you try and tell me to go to church? I know you. I know the way that you've lived. I know your actions. I grew up with you as a child, and now you're going to try to act like you're better than me and try to get me to come to church. You're not any better than me. You're not any better than these people. You're just a hypocrite. And you know what? They're right. They're right if they say that you're a hypocrite. Because here we are talking about how Jesus had power unlike any that anybody had ever seen before. How he had a message unlike any that anybody had ever seen before. How everyone should have been listening to him. And yet you don't listen to him all the time. There are things that you put at an equal or higher level than God's word. I know God's word says this, but here's the way that I feel today. I know God's word says this, but here is what my parents taught me, and I think that's a little bit different, so I'd rather do what they have to say. Here's what God's word says, but here's what the TV says, and here's what my friends say. So who is Jesus to act like he's any better than them? Or for that matter, better than any other religious leader out there? What makes Jesus different? A lot of people nowadays will say there is no difference. Jesus is the same as Buddha or Muhammad or anybody else who's out there. And to that I would say two things. Number one, Jesus had a message unlike any other. Christianity is different from every other religion for one reason. It's not because they tell people to be good. Every religion does that. Every religion says you're supposed to live a certain way. But here's what makes Christianity different. Jesus says, I want you to live a life that serves me. But even if you do, even if you do your very best, 
If you do your very best to keep God's law and read what's in the Bible and try to keep every single commandment, you can't do it. It is impossible. And so you will never be saved because of your actions. The only thing that you can do is trust in me that I would take your sins away and give you forgiveness. No other religion says that. Every other religion says you do good and good things will happen to you. But Jesus says, you can work as hard as you want, but it won't be enough for God. So that's why I came to take away your sins. And Jesus had power, unlike that anybody had ever seen. He raised a little girl from the dead. Now, there are some people who doubt that the resurrection of Jesus happened. That's understandable. People usually don't come back from the dead. People don't come out of tombs. People don't get up out of their caskets after they die. And yet the disciples believed in the resurrection. If you read the Bible, if you read the Gospels, it talks about the disciples' fear and doubt over and over and over again. How even Peter said to Jesus, Jesus, you're not going to die. You're not going to die for people. That's not going to happen. Just forget about that idea. And when Jesus was being persecuted, when he was seized and taken into custody, all of the disciples ran away. Every single one. And yet all of a sudden, after Jesus leaves, they're speaking with confidence and authority, and they're willing to die for Jesus. Now what made the difference? How could these scared, pitiful little men who had no formal training all of a sudden speak with conviction and boldness and be willing to suffer and die for Jesus? Almost without fail, every single one of the disciples died for their faith. Peter was crucified. James was beheaded. John was exiled on an island. The other disciples were killed in various other ways. What changed for these men that all of a sudden they were willing to die for Jesus? It was because they saw his power. The kind of power that he had over nature. The kind of power that he had over illness. The kind of power that he had over death. They saw the risen Lord Jesus Christ, and they knew that he was exactly who he said he was. And so they gave him the honor and respect, and they went out with boldness to preach that same message of forgiveness through Jesus and resurrection. But you and I are still hypocrites. You and I still don't trust in Jesus as much as we should. Even though we have the full benefit of the entire Bible, we've seen from beginning to end how God's plan of salvation was carried out. And you and I are sinners. For as much as we work and try to please God with our actions, we can't do it. And that's why Jesus came with power. A prophet without honor, even in his hometown, but Jesus lived a perfect life for your sake, and he died on the cross to take all of your sins away. So you are forgiven, and God accepts you right now because he has taken your sins away, and he loves you. And Jesus has in mind to keep on strengthening your faith. You can imagine the frustration that Jesus would have had as he was there in his hometown speaking to, to the kids that he would have grown up with, speaking to the adults who would have fed him meals and watched out for him, speaking to the people that he played games with, that he went to school with, that he worked in the fields with, maybe that he even sold furniture to. And here Jesus was desperately trying to reach them, and he couldn't. And it's not because all of a sudden he lost all the power he had, but it's because the people didn't trust him. Even though he had power over sickness and health, the people wouldn't even bring their sick family members for him to heal them. Jesus has in mind to do a lot of good in your life. He has in mind for you to be strengthened and encouraged. That when you pray to him, he will hear your prayers and answer them in the best way possible. That when you come to God with repentance and say, Lord, I have done something wrong, that he will build you up again and tell you that your sins are forgiven because of him. 
that when you doubt whether or not God loves you, he'll say, what about your baptism? I took your sins away. What about the times you heard my word preached and heard again in church, your sins are forgiven? What about the times that you received Holy Communion and were told once again, your sins have been taken away? We often don't treat God with the respect he deserves. Jesus was a prophet, more than a prophet, really. He was God himself. We often don't give him the honor he deserves. And yet he still has honored us with his life. He has taken our sins away. He has done everything for our benefit, and he wants to build you up. So come to him as the prophet, and he will encourage you and strengthen you and tell you once again that your sins are forgiven. I think we need to take it easy on chefs and on cooks and not have such unrealistic body expectations for them. If cooks aren't skinny, so what? Let them live their lives. I think we just need to stop picking on them. I think we need to say, what about mechanics? What about carpenters? What about doctors? What about surgeons, huh? Never trust a surgeon who won't operate on himself. That's what I say. Well, that's impossible, but you know, you get the point. Don't trust somebody who's giving you health advice if they won't take their own advice. Anyway, I'd say, let's leave the chefs alone. I've seen the way they work on Food Network. They're in those hot kitchens. They're sweating over the stoves. They, they put a lot of work into making sure that your quesadilla at Applebee's for half-off apps tastes good. You know what? And I respect that. Let's just give them a break. And at the same time, let's recognize that when we come to Jesus, we don't put our own expectations on him. We don't take the expectations of anybody else, but we just see what he has to say. We see the message that he's preaching. And we recognize that it's different from any message that any other religion has to offer. And we see the miraculous things that he has the power to do and recognize nobody else has the power to do this. No other person from any religion, not Mohammed, not Buddha, none of them can come back from the dead. But Jesus did. So let's treat him as that prophet, more than a prophet, as God. And let's come to him and see all the wonderful things that he has to do for our lives, including the forgiveness of sins. Amen.